Ahoy everyone! My name is Otto Bertolomescu. I'm the medical futurist and hopefully you can see me and hear me well enough. It's so good to be here with you again after a brief paternity leave in the last couple of weeks. Of course, I've been enjoying being with a newborn at home, but I was very much looking forward to interacting with you through this format. As some of you might know, I still travel around the world giving keynotes at events and conferences, but this is the format uh, maybe that I like the most through which we can finally have a dynamic discussion about one of the hottest topics of all times, uh, the use of AI and generative AI in medicine and healthcare. For those that are not familiar with either me or what we do at The Medical Futurist, very briefly, um, uh, I was trained as a physician and I did my PhD in genomics, but for the last one and a half decades, I've been transitioning towards becoming a professional futurist. So I'm a researcher, uh, I focus on the use of AI in regulations, uh, in, in medical education. I focus on how digital health is a cultural transformation of healthcare. So I, I share daily commentary because I check every single press release, company announcement, technological breakthrough and study. So you don't have to, and you can find those uh, daily commentaries and the daily context I provide on the social media channels of the medical futurist. And I do the same with my great collaborators around the world in the form of peer-reviewed studies and, and medical papers at the Medical Futurist Institute. So what you can expect from me in the next uh, less than one hour is that I plan to give you a short introduction to all the predictions and major trends I think we all should look forward to in 2024 when it comes to the use of AI in healthcare. So I want to set the tone for a good, a vibrant discussion here. And then I will open the floor for you to ask any questions that you have in mind. Moreover, thank you so much for all of you who registered for this event on tickettailor.com. I checked and you sent in more than 100 questions already. So I will not be able to answer all of those, but I will absolutely try my best to first of all, address those that ask questions live, and then I will jump back and forth and, and check out the ones you submitted before. Uh, thank you guys for being here in the chat. If you can share a few words with me, where you're coming from or where you are based. It always, you know, helps me understand uh, how international we are in terms of uh, the community here. And I will jump right into the questions. Uh, but before that, very briefly again, just to set the tone, we published uh, a few days ago an analysis, let me share that with you, about the major trends uh, in AI and generative AI in healthcare. And I just want to run through them so then we know what kind of topics we want to talk about, but please feel free to to the, to uh, you know ask more diverse uh, questions that are not related to these. But these are the trends I find to be the most important ones coming into 2024. The first is around how we will see a rise of generative AI platforms for healthcare. I was not so surprised when uh, last year, actually a few months after ChatGPT was introduced, a company called Nabla immediately introduced the use of these large language models into turning patient conversations into action. And they sort of implemented ChatGPT into their actual service. And I see, we've seen a rise of these, but um, I would like to focus on those that uh, help manage healthcare better. So I'm not talking about the you know traditional way of using AI for healthcare in terms of analyzing huge amounts of data and uh, drawing conclusions that human beings couldn't uh, because of the massive amounts of data sets. But uh, I'm talking about how generative AI platforms, especially large language models, could be used to save time for physicians, to help patients feel like they are being taken care of, even though it's an AI that they're having a discussion with. And you can expect certain, not medical conditions, but the, the management of certain conditions to stand out in that sense. I'm talking about mental health, um, diabetes, maybe even pregnancy, you know, conditions uh, where you need to interact with patients for a longer uh, period. The second trend I would like to show to you or share it with you is around how medical large language models arise. So it's one thing that we can use uh, chat GPT like tools for asking medical and health related questions, but it's another very important thing to specifically train these large language models on um, ma medical data, medical examinations, medical textbooks. The, I think the one, the one example that stands out clearly uh, from this crowd is MedPalm, the one um, analyzed and, and um, trained by DeepMind and Google researchers. So to, to be able to 
implement large language models into the evidence-based part of medicine, uh, you, you need to expect to see large language models specifically trained on, uh, on medical databases. The third trend here, and we will finish this soon, so we can jump into the questions, is around my, one of my favorite topics of the last few months, multimodal large language models. So it's one thing that uh, most large language models like ChatGPT has, have been able to analyze text. That's why they have been unimodal, but medicine, of course, is a multimodal discipline, and you need to analyze not just text, but images, audio, video, any kind of content and data. And I've been, I actually published a paper about this. I foresee multimodal large language models to become the uh, ultimate uh, interfaces for physicians working at a hospital. So just one short example about this. Imagine a hospital where physicians have to use electronic medical records. They have to uh, fill in insurance forms. Uh, at the radiology department, they use a different kind of AI uh, for analyzing radiology scans. And maybe the patient also brings in some data and they use the tool aided by AI. You know, how can you make sense of all those? What, as a physician, you, do you have to learn to use all these individual siloed AI tools? Of course not. But one generative AI platform could be the interface for all that. And I think that's where multimodal large language models can come into the picture. The fourth trend is around digital twins, not those twins that we've been talking about for years, you know, uh, using vital signs and health parameters and maybe radiology scans of patients to create their digital twins. So maybe they can we can test drugs on those twins. But I'm talking about AI-based models, like the ones I have created um, with a company um, called Synthesia. I created a digital twin of myself. Plus, I shared on LinkedIn that there was a, another company called Heygen uh, that allowed me to speak Spanish, even though I don't speak Spanish yet. I'm just learning. And even the, you know, the lip sync was there and, and the whole experience was that I was speaking Spanish, but I was speaking English and I was recording that video in English. Uh, the fifth trend is around how we have right now about 700 ish, um, FDA approved AI based medical technologies. And of course, every few months or so we come back to analyze these. We were the first ones to publish a paper about these, a study, and then I think even a few weeks ago, and was it December? So yeah, about a month ago, we analyzed the state of these FDA approved devices and the submission types they have. And I foresee these the, this number to reach uh, uh, over 1000 this year. The six is about an influx of AI tools for patients, not specifically generative AI tools, but tools that use AI and, and the primary uh, audience base would be patients like skin checking applications, you know, starting with skin vision and, and all these. And uh, it's quite expectable that patients will be able to use AI-based tools to analyze their lab results. So everything, every data they get through their healthcare, I think there would be a tool for that aided by artificial intelligence to make you know, sense of the information. And last, and then I finish this very short briefing about this, is about the importance of prompt engineering. I, I published this paper uh, a few weeks ago um, about how, why prompt engineering is an important emerging skill for medical professionals and even published this um, infographic that I will share with you in a second about what kind of specific tips and recommendations you might want to keep in mind while using um, ChatGPT like tools or large language models. I'm just sharing the link to the infographic in the chat. And in the meantime, thank you so much for all of you for being here and for sharing where you're coming from. I can see India, South Africa, London, France, Italy, um, India, the U USA, amazing. So thank you so much guys for being here. And now let's jump into the questions because I don't want to, I don't want you to feel like you have to wait so long for a question, but I wanted to give you a, you know, briefing about what we might want to talk about here. Dr. Z, good morning from San Francisco. Okay. And the question is, and I will share the question with you too. So all of you can see it. Can you comment on the actuality and potential for senior care robots companions? Of course. We've covered this on medicalfuturist.com before. There are about more than 10 companion robots out there, um, but none of these has been able to break the barriers, you know, of adoption and limitations. But I think what AI has as a potential for this specific field is, is coming from generative AI, because these pets have not been able to interact with patients, just, you know, purr or just walk around like a robot dog, but that's, that doesn't 
help create an emotional bond with patients. But with generative AI, some of these pets could interact with patients and, and that could help them become a real companion robot. Catchy Chez, with a very catchy name, uh, asked this question. How do you convince the AI naysayers that are against the use of black box models? But a good question to ask. It depends on what kind of naysayers we are talking about. If you're talking about like physician naysayers, then you don't have to convince them by, you know, good arguments, but you have to use the power of evidence-based medicine because physicians have to apply to the power and the rules of evidence-based medicine. And if there is a study, if there, is, if there are peer-reviewed studies and clinical trials, if there is evidence showing that an AI tool is essential and is safe and they should be using it, they will use it because that's how medical guidelines work. For the others, I think we had to use the same tactics as what we have been using at the Medical Futurist with naysayers about the importance of digital health. And it's not that I want to persuade them to think otherwise, but I want to honestly understand the reasons for their resistance or anxiety or reluctance about using an, an advanced technology. Because if I understand the cultural, emotional reasons behind that, maybe I would be in a better position to, uh, to put them on the same page. Uh, Zaguri Guillaume, thank you so much for supporting us on this YouTube channel. Uh, Kishar Dio, how to use AI in liver transplant? Um, I have no idea, but I think we've published uh, a video, a short video on YouTube about how AI can be used to help uh, better organize uh, transplant matching processes. Th that might be relevant to your question. Uh, Kevin Freimuth, I'm curious about your predictions on AI use cases that will be most useful within pharma and those that will not. Thank you. Um, I think the most useful ones in pharma would be around using AI for drug design and drug repurposing because this is the easiest ROI for pharma companies. I mean, uh, there are use cases for using generative AI for customer management or for um, e-detailing, but the ROI is the biggest when you can shorten the time of a clinical trial, you can decrease the cost of clinical trials. So I expect pharma to, to thrive on, on that opportunity. Uh, <laughs> Oliver, <laughs> okay. Uh, TMF is not trial master file, it's uh, the medical futurist, but uh, I even I don't use the abbreviation often. Uh, okay, Kishore, yes, thank you. Andrea Feyer, how will AI impact cancer prevention in uh, 2024? Well, in an ideal way, AI should help, um, it should contribute to how healthcare has been trying to focus on prevention, but we know well, no matter which country we are talking about, it's not really happening. So I think the way it can contribute to uh, cancer prevention is through our the patient's individual access to technologies. In my case, I had a genome sequencing test and I learned that my risk for skin cancer is very high. So I have a dermatologist who checks all my skin lesions every one year. Plus I use a, an app based on AI that rechecks some of my suspicious lesions every three or six months. This way, I feel like I'm using AI in my cancer prevention because I have a partner physician in that process. And my medical team already consists of me as a patient, medical professionals, and artificial intelligence. Dr. Z, to what extent do these medical large language models uh, need to be interoperable or are we at risk of further siloing medical care? Uh, it, these have to be interoperable, but I think these won't be interoperable because individual companies uh, developing certain LLMs won't be able to merge the data with others and, and use the same guidelines. That's why I see a huge potential in multimodal large language models. You deploy one M LLM into a hospital and through that MLLM, you will be able to interact with the radiology department's AI tool, with the tool that is being used in the electronic medical records and all these. Otherwise, it's practically impossible to learn to use all these tools. Okay, um, ooh, ooh, okay good. a good number of questions are coming in. I'm very happy about it. I'm trying to catch up with the next one. Some of you are just sharing comments. That's more than fine. I just want to focus on... Oh, um, where I can study the 700 plus AI based medical devices. 
you will get the link in a second. It's on the FDA website and I'm very proud to say that. The link is just in the chat right now. I'm very proud to say that they cite our study. We were the first ones at the Medical Visualist Institute to publish a paper about these. Uh, Thibault Locher, Lo Lo I'm sorry if I pronounce your names in a wrong way, I'm trying my best. Billions have been spent and ultimately resulted in discontinued clinical trials, of course. With genomics and AI, it seems many could be revital revitalized with advanced targeting on genes. How realistic is that? I think that's what the whole promise of in silico clinical trials uh, could deliver to clinical trials. Simply because these clinical trials are not sustainable in the long term. We know that by now the risk is just so huge for pharma companies that they spend billions and maybe even a decade on something and that won't become a product. And they haven't done anything wrong. It's just that the product couldn't deliver uh, or couldn't live up to the, to the expectations, to the scientific expectations around that. But with deep learning based models, and that's what I see in, in some studies around the world in in silico clinical trials, it will be possible to start with more potential drug targets or drug molecules with um, less time and less money, but testing most of them on in silico models, maybe even um, organ on a cheap technologies, but I still see a bigger promise in just using AI and creating the, uh, virtually billions of patient models and testing drugs on them. Um, Reb Buckley, I could see the MLLMs as a fascinating tool for clinical research, allowing the sites to maintain their own technology, yet still pass required data along to the sponsor companies. I think federated learning has been uh, the kind of solution for that, through which it's possible to use the power of deep learning, uh, but you don't have to share the data, the precious like private patient data doesn't have to leave the IT infrastructure of a hospital building to be able to do that. All right. Uh, I, IVM NL, maybe that's the, that's the name here. How to tackle automation bias? Will doctors of the future of you rely too much solely on AI model outputs? That's a good question. I think we've had something similar as an issue back then when the internet became a big thing. And uh, some, of, some people thought that because of relying too much on the online information physicians can find, they will lose their you know, essence and knowledge and power in the medical decision making, but that has not been the case. I expect the same thing to happen with AI, that it's more like um, um, a substitution for certain things we are not good at, but all in all, it just simply cannot replace what a physician, do, uh, a physician does. And I'm looking for a specific paper I wanted to share with you that came out uh, maybe a few days ago. Uh, here it is. I just shared the link in the chat and I can also share it with you in a second. Here is the link in the chat and here is the paper. And the reason why I want to share this paper with you is that uh, it showed Google researchers actually published it in NPJ Digital Medicine and it showed that it was the AI, I mean, large language models were great at clinical reasoning, but they were bad at a few things. And I want to be very specific here. It, the GPT-4 showed improved reasoning abilities, but not accuracy. So it's like, it's the best assistant anyone can ever hope for. You know, you can uh, jump back and forth about ideas. Maybe you are thinking about differential diagnosis. It's like having the best colleague out there, but you have to dis describe an, everything in your head to get something meaningful as the answer. So I expect physicians to uh, start learning those tricks uh, around using AI. All right. Uh, Matthew Hellier, in terms of growth regarding generative AI, what would be your suggestion to stay relevant? Do you think that it would be impossible to keep up to date with the rate of growth? It's a good question. I, I sort of have the same feeling, you know, the fear of missing out that if I don't check something out there, a study, a company press release announcement, then I will lose, I will miss something important. But that has not been the case. I think um, the, the, the growth rate has been extraordinary in the first year and maybe in the background, you know, in the server rooms of big technology companies and AI developers, the growth will keep on being the same, you know, really high level. But on the interface level, how we people can interact with these systems, we simply cannot keep up with that kind of growth. So um, I expect to keep up 
you know, seeing some improvements in how we use prompt engineering, how we learn to better work with AI, but it's not going to be the same as the first year uh, since uh, ChatGPT was introduced to the masses. Uh, Dr. Imran Banat, a very valid question. How can generative AI be implemented in underdeveloped nations? You know, it's a, it's a health equity issue. We at the Medical Futurists come back to so often. Because I feel like when we get, you know, criticisms about the technologies we want to be to get deployed in, in healthcare across uh, the world, then uh, the biggest criti critical remark is usually about, well, what about underdeveloped regions where there is no internet access? Well, exactly. So digital health and, and AI in healthcare, these fields cannot deliver their promises unless there is a good amount of technological equity. And that's something healthcare and AI researchers cannot bring to the field. It's something that governments and, and healthcare organizations can do. So at the end of the day, I think health equity is primarily a technological equity issue. If those patients had access to the internet, just this basic thing, then because of the amazing amount of and range of digital health and AI services in healthcare, the patients would definitely benefit from using them because of not having internet access, they cannot. That's why it's a technological equity issue. Shelby Lane, uh, how can I find this information? Please let me know what information and I will share the link again in the chat. Uh, Catchy Chess, who assumes the risks, risk for fully automated AI systems? Well, those that developed the systems. There is no difference here between a medical technology company developing a digital stethoscope device and another company developing an AI-based service. Regulating these is different, I, I get it, but when it comes to the legal consequences, the, you know, the ethical background is the same. If a technology was developed in the wrong way, then the companies developing them will take full legal responsibility. If the stethoscope is faulty because of how it was produced and, and released to the market, then the company will have the legal responsibility. The same applies to AI. All right. Hello from Duisburg, Germany. Uh, okay. Can you tell us about your experience with coughless blood pressure measurement devices? I, I would love to, but there is a, an article about this on medicalfutures.com, and I would love to keep this discussion about AI and, and generative AI. Uh, Dr. Imran Banat, generative AI in pharma can be used for content creation and digital marketing. Absolutely, but that's quite a tricky field um, for pharma already, even without using AI that might, you know, hallucinate uh, bad results. And uh, it's quite a risk to jump into the field for pharma companies. Uh, Matthew Heliar, uh, one last question. How do you suppose one should start from developing these skills in learning how to engineer and prompt AI? Literally, the best thing I can tell you is to check out the infographic I'm sharing again in the, in the, in the chat, because I think it contains all the basic details, all the practical tips and recommendations that you can definitely start with. Uh, Gabi Fala, how can AI be of use in clinical trials? We discussed sort of this question before in through in silico clinical trials, either by using AI for drug design and drug repurposing, you know, there's a drug maybe having evidence to be used in blood pressure management, but the drug could also interact well enough through um, physiological ways in like diabetes management and it could be used, so it could be repurposed. And AI could help um, make these processes a bit faster and more efficient, maybe even cheaper. All right. Uh, Truta Florina, please give me an example of a software solution built with AI to cover a real medical need. I love these questions. Uh, I just shared the FDA database, and as all of these approved medical devices must have a, a purpose to serve, a medical need to address, then I just shared 690 something examples with you. Uh, okay, Benjamin Don't, to what? Let me share the question with you. To what extent do you think AI has proven tangible impact in clinical and the real world setting and not on retrospective data and analytics? That's a huge issue that if, you, if, if the developers of AI-based medical tools cannot prove their tools worth in uh, prospective studies, how can we expect physicians and healthcare leaders to start deploying them? That's an issue. But uh, a good example is 
what DeepMind researchers came up with like one and a half years ago. They did a prospective study uh, and they were able to demonstrate that their AI tool was able to predict which patients might have a much higher risk for acute um, kidney failure. And I think that's brilliant. These are the kinds of prospective studies we need to prove their worth. Uh, Yao Antwi, Antwi Ajay asked the question, how can AI help in structuring clinical notes to make it easily analyzable? Not only there is a handful of companies doing that already, like uh, the Microsoft's Nuance, but you can ask ChatGPT to do it for you. Just um, take a medical record and ask ChatGPT to, or just write a medical note and ask ChatGPT to transform it into a standardized, standardized formatted medical record and it will be able to do that. Uh, what are your thoughts around the EU AI Act and the impact on AI development in life science area? Well, live, someone living in the EU, I should be very um, happy about this AI, e, EU AI Act, but I'm not. I mean, I guess it's fine regarding the general use of AI. But for medicine and healthcare, uh, the guidelines should be so different. And I think the European Medicines Agency, for example, should just follow the footsteps of the FDA in that. And I even expect the FDA to um, regulate adaptive AI algorithms this year, you know, algorithms that will change with every decision they make. And that's a huge challenge and risk uh, to regulate, but I think they will solve it. And I expect EU organizations to follow their footsteps. Okay. Um, do you see any potential of AI in medical underwriting or claim investigation in health insurance sector? Absolutely. Not, not only on the side of physicians um, submitting insurance forms. Large language models have been able to do that from day one. But even I've seen, I think I even shared studies showing that um, claims have been assessed differently by health insurance companies when they started using AI. Of course, you know, with less empathy, AI started making more numerical mathematical decisions so absolutely you can see you can expect a change in that sector too uh, Gavi Fala, how will ai models be able to simulate the physiology of the human body and the pharmacodynamics that need to be investigated during in human clinical trials i will share uh, an article with you in which we cover this uh, in details and hopefully it's going to give you a much better response again with details than what I can in like, you know, 30 seconds. Yeah, I just added it to the chat. How do you see the future of neuroimagining? Um, it's quite a broad question to ask very excitingly because radiology is the medical specialty that clearly stands out in the way of uh, how many, for example, FDA approved AI based medical technologies we see on the market. And neurology is a field that combines so much data that human physicians or researchers are not able to physically analyze them and it sounds to me like the perfect combination for for merging these technologies uh, uh, Shelby Lane uh, can AI be used to do research and develop drugs in microgravity I have no idea why these things could be should be uh, related um, okay what do you think about multiple sclerosis treatment with artificial intelligence achievements uh, I haven't seen you know big changes in that. I've seen good studies showing that AI can be used to uh, find unusual associations, for example, analyzing patients' phone recordings and then uh, predict their risk of developing either Alzheimer's or Parkinson's later in their life. So on the diagnosis front, I see exciting stuff, but not on the treatment part. In what ways do you think AI can realistically empower non-physician healthcare professional workforce? like nurses to ease workforce shortage. Very fine question to ask. I think uh, here, the only thing that helps them would be through using generative AI. That's that's the easiest, the low hang, lowest hanging fruit here that they also do administration, but they shouldn't be doing that because that's a waste of effort, time and, and talent. And generative AI can be very uh, useful in solving that for them. Richard Hebbis asked the question, how are ethical guidelines and data security measures being implemented to protect patient well-being in the rollout of AI in healthcare? Absolutely fair question to ask. 
I think the FD has been in the forefront of this and the way they have been handling not just the uh, individual assessment of medical technologies, but even the assessment of companies developing these individual technologies should be an example for every regulatory body out there. I think regarding ethical guidelines, uh, there, there's a lot of discussion and many studies about bias and mitigating bias in healthcare, you know, uh, consciously preparing the makers, developers, researchers of AI-based medical technologies to avoid uh, using biased databases even while creating those algorithms. And by data security measures, uh, I think the best we can hope for is that these individual companies understand the importance of the privacy of patient data. But of course, that's not the case in the vast majority of them. No offense to those companies. I understand that without patient data, it's practically impossible to develop these AI-based medical technologies. So I don't expect them to do the right thing, but I very much expect our policymakers and government officials to protect our data. Um, federated learning as technology, for example, can be very helpful in doing that. Okay, Rob Charlton from Manchester. How will the future of AI agents specifically for prevention of disease reduce the likelihood of disease forming? I like to think about this in a way that, well, I can think about this in two ways, or I can describe it in two ways. One way is that patients will be able to use, to have access to a range of AI-based technologies that would just sort of help take care of them. These technologies would get access to their vital signs and health parameters through uh, smartphone connected ECGs, their medical records and lab results and all those. But for that, you need um, a system-wide deployment of AI and I just don't expect that to happen in a decade or so. The other part could be that the way patients, millions of us would have access now to generative AI, those uh, generative AI platforms could act like uh, a health navigators for us. You know, a, a person could be that, but we cannot afford to have a health navigator person, an, an expert in the healthcare systems, and yet someone who would understand our special needs together in the form of a human being. But just having this scaled up with generative AI, that's something I can absolutely uh, expect to see in the near future. Gerhard Bothma, what is the best AI in healthcare book you have read? I'm not sure if you can see that behind me, uh, but I'm sure the, the, your, the AI will see you now from Eric Topol is the one that stands out. And there was a book called Artificial Intelligence. So not, not artificial, but artificial intelligence. I love that too. Uh, Kaji, have you tried the Met Prompt LLM framework for Microsoft? Um, thank you for the tip. I haven't, I haven't tried it yet, but now I will look into it. Really appreciate the tip. How will AI support commercial teams in delivering integrated patient experiences that go beyond the pill? I'm not sure about that. For that, just imagine uh, pharma companies have to be able to use AI in creating messages tailored for individual patient needs. And uh, I only see, you know, regulatory risks and challenges with that. I, I would be happy if I just saw pharma companies using AI for drug design purposes for now. Uh, truth of honor, where do you see the EU health tech market in the next years? Um, even though I'm based in the EU, I'm, I'm based in Hungary, I never like to comment on individual regions because the genetic test I've used, uh, it was coming from Australia. Another one I used with a microbiome test was a Belgian company. But the, uh, the app I use for checking my skin lesions is based in the US. So, you know, which health market am I related to while receiving healthcare in my own country? Uh, of course, Rob, it's, it's my pleasure. Uh, Timo Loscher, have educational programs, med schools, residencies, begin training physicians on AI? Yes, there are some courses I've seen already at Stanford, at Harvard. There is one I teach at uh, my alma mater, University of Debrecen, where I teach uh, not just medical, but also PhD students about the use of AI and generative AI. But I'm sure that without even looking into it, there are dozens of university programs already. Of course, that's not enough. And that's why we published a paper about the need for an upgraded uh, Hippocratic Oath uh, to make sure that every single medical student in the world gets access to AI-based courses. 
uh, what kind of safeguards should be put in place for using AI for symptom checking, triaging by GPs? The reason why it's really hard for me to, to respond to that is that it, the, the, the knowledge about what safeguards we need shouldn't come from us, shouldn't come from the developers of those tools or the users of those tools, but that should be, you know, set in stone guidelines and regulations coming from medical associations that is from the respective medical um, specialties, for example, primary care in this case, or emergency medicine, being very clear about what kind of tools they can deploy and release to the market. Uh, and there are some such guidelines in radiology. If you check the American Association of Radiology, you'll find really amazing papers, studies, even guidelines for authors of scientific papers for making sure how to report AI-based tools when they publish in, in those journals. Uh, Kevin Framuth uh, asked the question, do you have any studies that evaluate the accuracy of AI-based tools used in the clinical setting, uh, providing diagnostic assistance, preparing video summaries? Absolutely. I think even this uh, paper I, I shared with you not so long ago, I, I add the link to the chat again, not that one, but the link. Um, this one is a good example for that. Anthony Chang has a good book about that too. Thank you, Kachi Chaz. Uh, Chef Saparu, you sent the question when you registered, then I have to find your question. Uh, now I know your name, so I know what to look for. Uh, I think I found you. You have two two questions, maybe. Uh, how are large language model specific to a clinical field? Are plan to provide holistic uh, R&D answers as many are interconnected by metabolic health? If that's the question, then I don't understand it. Then <laughs> please elaborate on it a little bit. Uh, Janet, of course, of course, I, you know, I would love to go to the questions that were pre-submitted, but you are so many questions, fortunately, on the live stream that I've been going through them. But I will now look for your question. Just give me a second here. I found it. How will AI affect the medical clinical setting? It's quite a broad question to ask if you mean by what specific changes in a physician's daily life, you know, uh, would, would appear, then I think... Um, Physicians in like a decade won't be won't feel comfortable making complex medical decisions like um, designing treatment plans or or making really advanced complex diagnosis by themselves without rechecking it with AI. I think that's a good enough summary of how a physician's job would be different. Um, Venu Tamatabatula. I had a question about mental health, as far as I can see. A lot of AI therapists have cropped up and many claim to be based on CBT principles, but none are effective and have not made a mark. Is AI therapist possible? Um, in theory, I, I think it's possible to provide, to develop generative AI tools that can act like a human therapist, even in a, you know, in a standard peer-reviewed study being compared to the efficiency of real mental health therapists. I think in theory it's possible, but because of empathy is reflective and patients will know that they are talking to an AI, I think that's not the case here. That's not the purpose that we should have in mind. The purpose we should have in mind is that there's, there's such a huge gap between how many physicians we can train and how many patients need medical help that some mental health patients will have to get access to generative AI tools, AI therapy chatbots, as long as they can have access to a real life physician in person. But for the time being, it could be an amazing tool, especially if you know enough evidence is being uh, summarized in the background. Uh, Shelby Lane, how can, it's very strange that you asked a question in, with different caps lock parts. How can AI be used to facilitate health management and health issue on NASA analog astronaut missions? And his study is a very good question to us. Uh, I had an interview with Scott Kelly, uh, the, the famous astronaut, and I asked him what kind of digital health technologies they have been using in training and on the International Space Station, and he said none. They had a few basic medical technologies, but those were medical because only the um, uh, mission control uh, had access to the data, but the astronauts did not. And I asked him, how can we expect NASA to bring people to Mars where you have to wait you know, um, when the information takes about 20, 20 minutes 
to get from the space station or, or from a space uh, yeah, space station to the mission control back on Earth when there is a medical emergency. So they have to involve the astronauts the way patients are being involved in digital health. So I'm, I, I wouldn't be very optimistic about the using AI for those purposes for now. Catchy Jess had one more question. Should doctors disclose to their patients that AI was used to aid in their diagnosis or is it similar to asking a clinical colleague for help? I think it depends on the um, the ethical mindset of a physician. Um, do they disclose it when they discuss their case with a colleague? I think as part of their job, they don't. Uh, so for me, it will be just the same. But if they use AI and maybe they use AI and overwrite, the AI would overwrite their primary decision or diagnostic, you know, medical decision making process, then I would definitely disclose. So if AI had a huge impact on the final outcome, then I think it would be fair to disclose it to patient. One more issue that we are writing an article about on medicalfutures.com is about, you know, there was a story, a story that someone went, it went for a mammogram and there was a option for buying a mammogram and buying a mammogram with AI advanced analysis and it cost more and it was not covered by insurance. I think that's a really interesting question to ask. Uh, Omer Kasher, or Kasher had a question about tutors. What is your thought on the use of AI tutors to enhance the various educational modalities in healthcare, such as your own online courses? I, I wish I was a medical student now and not um, sooner or later, 15 years ago. I, I can just only imagine what kind of things I would have been able to achieve by using generative AI as a medical student to ask it to, well, this is what I want to learn and, and I study about, please act as my tutor and, and start asking questions to make sure that we're on the same page and you understand my level of knowledge about that topic. Just imagine just one prompt about this. So absolutely, I, I see a great future in that. But regarding the courses we published, uh, I, I don't see a place for now because I know exactly what I want to teach through those courses. But as a student, when I, I'm not sure about the actual package of knowledge I want to learn, but it's more open-ended, you know, then I would turn to online uh, chat GPT like tutors. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, link to buy your books in discounted price. That are, we, have, we have such a huge bundle uh, discount right now. I wish I had a link at the end of this. Uh, Chef Subaru, specific large language models for diseases are explored, like radiology and cardiology. How can we connect them so as to reflect the whole human? Uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, we, these models do not understand anything about, you know, ethics or human physiology. These are really amazing at understanding text and, you know, giving textual answers to textual questions, but we can ex expect them to do more than that. And I think that's more than enough. We will, have the, we will have to keep on being the experts in this ecosystem, but LLMs will be the assistance we have ever hoped for. Do you recommend uh, to use ChatGPT 3.4 or 4? Well, the newer version, of course, that's, that's almost always the case for technological improvements. Plus GPT-4 uh, is more advanced when it comes to reasoning, plus, um, it can deal with more complex questions, even multi-level challenges. Three, it can now create and analyze images. And that's quite a, you know, a range of difference between ChatGPT 3.5 and 4. Uh, all right, just a few questions that were submitted throughout the online forum. Uh, Olha Berezna had this question, how to navigate through the thousands of AI health solutions? Um, I'm smiling because I hate to answer a question by sharing a resource we have published on the medicalfutures.com. But, but in this case, um, I want to share with you the top 100 companies we just shared. First of all, I shared a link in the chat. And now I share the actual, where is it? Here it is. Look at it. Look at this, this monstrous infographic that we published on LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter. I personally curated the top 100 digital health and AI companies and the blue part here, I mean, um, this part here, these are the AI based healthcare companies that, uh, that I selected for this year's list to cover. So please feel free to check those out. 
and that's how it's easier to navigate among the thousands of AI-based health solutions. All right, we have about 30 minutes left, so I will try to switch gears here. Uh, next one is how uh, Phil Grasso had this question. How will misinformation be filtered out from machine learning information uh, repositories, I guess? Um, I'm afraid even though companies behind these LLMs like OpenAI have been trying to to deploy safeguards about this. We, the users, will have to be the ones assessing the quality of information we get. Like, you know that LLMs can hallucinate, but even it can hallucinate resources it based its answers on. So always, it's always I have to be the one to make sure that the reason, the, the outcome I get is something I can use. Uh, how will patient manage their disease in 2030 with AI? It's coming from Mirka Schaller. Uh, well, let's think about how I manage my conditions now. And I think that's what hopefully most people will have access to in like six years from now. Uh, the medical team consists of medical professionals, patients, and AI-based tools. I can use these AI-based tools to assess my health reports, my medical records, my lab results, my um, you know skin lesions, my genetic testing results, and all these, and provide me with an assessment. I can use that assessment to go to my primary care physician, who I have a eco level partnership with, and we can design a preventive plan. And what AI does in the process is that it constantly reevaluates my risk scores, maybe reassesses my our uh, preventive plans, and try to ask the relevant questions. Just like having an amazing physician sitting next to you twenty four hours a day. Maybe it doesn't sound that you know good right now saying it out loud. But if you want to live a long and healthy life, that's the kind of uh, medical support you need or healthcare support you need through our, throughout your life. How will regulatory agencies, agencies adjust to AI speed of learning? Well, um, the, the FDA has been struggling with that. And I talked about uh, adaptive algorithms in those cases when the AI would change with every decision they make. So even though the regulatory agency assesses one technology, a technology will keep on changing millions of times every day. So in those cases, the regulators can only assess the quality of companies developing those AI-based technologies, and they will regulate companies primarily and not the individual technologies those um, uh, share. Uh, Ricardo Bezzo has a very interesting question here. Let me share it with you. Do you see a risk to the maintenance and development of natural intelligence in relying too much on AI? Is there a risk that in the future, human critical and intuitive capacity might be used? It's a fair question to ask, unfortunately. I think the risk is there, uh, especially for those that are a bit lazier than others. You know, I'm talking about those people who, who like to save as much time as possible because it's easier for AI to, to get the job done. But the more we use AI, the more you will catch these cheaters. So uh, just one example, uh, in the online course that I teach uh, at University of Debrecen, every half year, 100 students submit written assignments. I ask them to write science fiction short stories or, or press releases about AI going berserk in 10 years from now. And I've been using ChatGPT myself so much every single day that when I see a text, I started, you know, I can feel like I can taste like it was written by AI. And there are, there are tools like uh, gpt0.com that, that can help you assess whether it was written by AI or not. And in like 99% of cases, I was right. So when I, when I see a text, when I see an email, and I feel like it was written by AI, it loses credibility and quality immediately. So maybe on the long term, we will cherish more when we see original content made by people, maybe with the help of AI, but not entirely created by AI. Uh, what is the differentiation proof you would look for to identify the top AI solutions as you have 1000 claiming to use AI for your discovery? What are the indicators for something will work? It's a good question to, to ask Arushi Agraval. I look for basic things, just like in the case of other medical technologies. I look for evidence in the background. A company can claim anything they want. No one can, you know, punish them for that. Uh, maybe the regulators. 
but if there is no clinical trial and evidence-based study in the background to back their claims, these are just unjustified claims. You, you cannot imagine how many companies reach out to me uh, individually and personally to show me that I missed this or that company's newest amazing technology. And then I ask back, can you please show me a clinical trial result or a peer-reviewed study about the, the, the efficiency and the safety of the technology? And like in four out of five cases, they cannot. But they keep on telling me that, but they have these claims. But those claims are not, not justified. So I would look for evidence-based medicine because this is the strongest indicator of success. Without studies, no one can use even the words best medical technology in the practice of medicine or the deliver delivery of healthcare. Uh, Madeline Mayer has a very interesting question here. How do healthcare AI developers perceive AI's role in complementing healthcare professionals' decision-making process without undermining the importance of human touch in patient care? It's a very smart question to ask, but I don't think that not even one uh, company developing AI out there would be able to you know, look at healthcare's future from that advanced, mature perspective. I don't think they care about the human touch. They care about making sure that their, their tool is working properly in a specific medical or healthcare setting, that they can deliver what they claim that the technology can deliver. I just don't expect them to have this advanced perspective, but I very much expect policymakers and government officials to have your perspective and make sure that they create guidelines and regulations through which only those technologies would get deployed in healthcare that would, on the long term, contribute to making the doctor-patient relationship better, for example. <coughs> Sorry, uh, Dr. Imran Banat, how, how ethical can AI be in healthcare? Uh, it's a good question to ask. I think it can, AI can be as ethical as it was made to be. So it's, it's not an AI's decision to be ethical or not. It's, it depends on the database it was fed with, because AI is only as good as the database we feed it with. If a database is biased, for example, if we develop a skin checking application and we only use anatomical databases of people with uh, lighter skin, then the, the final AI product will make bad decisions, bad assessments on the photos of skin lesions with, of people with darker skin. Not because the AI is making an unethical decision here or it's biased, but because the database was biased. So it depends on the developers. Uh, Laura Davis, do you have an advisory board of other physicians? I mean, if you mean at the Medical Futurist, we don't, because we don't develop a product to have an advisory board for. But fortunately, I, I'm quite in a lucky position to get access to so many healthcare professionals, policymakers, regulators, developers, researchers, and patient advocates, empowered patients throughout my channels that I, I receive enough you know, suggestions, uh, remarks, um, contributions, and criticisms to make sure that um, we at the Medical Futurist can thrive to have an as objective overview about these technologies as possible. Um, Arushi Agrawal, uh, intrigued on your opinion, that despite the excitement around AI for drug discovery, there hasn't been a clinical success with this and the lead time has been slow. Any learning? I, I wouldn't be that pessimistic though. Um, if you check companies like turbine.io or .ai, I think they have quite good track records working with pharma companies and contributing with their AI tool to their um, um, clinical trial processes. What is your strategy to decide whether or not to use ChatGPT, considering the huge amount of electricity to answer a single question? <laughs> I loved how you started the question, but I don't understand the electricity part in the in the second in the second half. I decide my strategy in a way that if I could have a very smart individual sitting with me right now and I could describe my problem to him or her and we would be able to have a very vibrant discussion and maybe I would get new ideas based on that, then I decide to use ChatGPT because that's what I use ChatGPT for, to you know, shoot back and forth ideas and, and make it ask me the right questions so I can get into a better position to make better decisions. What is the best way to educate current physicians on the opportunities of AI that tend to typically be negative about AI? Thank you for this question. First of all, because I can share an open access paper we published exactly about this, the absolute minimal guide about AI to uh, healthcare and medical professionals. I'm very proud of that paper. 
we published in NPJ uh, Digital Medicine, just at one. Plus, you give me a chance to share three things here. Um, first of all, thank you so much for being with me for the last one hour or so. I, I can't count how many questions you asked, but I'm really grateful to all of you and appreciate you being here. We will have these live Q&As every three weeks from now on about really exciting and different diverse topics. Second of all, uh, you might ask um, how I keep on having this amazing team at The Medical Futurist. Well, with your support. And the way you can, you can support us is uh, four ways. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel and join us here. Second, you can do one of our courses. We have one about digital health and one about artificial intelligence in healthcare. These are the courses I stand by and I designed every single lecture and lesson and video and text in there myself with a very dedicated team. So that's one way you can support us. The second is you can find all the ebooks and executive summaries we have published on leanpub.com. Uh, there is a free preview under each. Plus, if you buy one but you don't like it, there is a 60 days uh, money back guarantee for that. And the third, you can join a very special community on patreon.com slash the medical futurist where we share content we don't share anywhere else and by you some of you actually hundreds of you being with us on patreon and youtube and thousands of you being us with the executive summaries and the courses we can keep on providing objective content you have to know we don't have ads on medicalfuturist.com and we don't have um, you know product placements and stuff like that but we try to keep on being as objective as possible that's why we focus on peer-reviewed research and our daily commentary on all the social media channels of The Medical Futurist. And again, thank you so much for being here with me. I hope that you will check some of these links and I hope that you had a good time and you found something useful in this discussion. I've learned a lot through the amazing questions you asked. If you ask question, if you had a question submitted to me before the live Q&A, I will try to reach out to you personally. I mean it, not just you know, with answers made by Generative AI. And then the plan is that uh, see you again in three or four weeks on this channel. I hope you have a wonderful day and thank you so much again for being here, here with me. I've been Dr. Bertrand Meshko, your med the medical futurist, and I hope to see you on all the medical futurist channels. Thank you and bye.